Checkout Tracking by the NPD Group brings you a receipt collecting system that gathers data anonymously through technology we created, providing your businesses with answers. And you're gonna use. All right, so 3.30 p.m., I hope you're not too sleepy, and I'm very excited to start this panel. Um, these are four companies that I've been learning a lot from, that I've been following from the distance for the last three years, and this is actually the first time that I see the four of them sitting uh, together and wrestling together. So I'm sure uh, I've prepared a, a list of questions that hopefully uh, represent actually what everything you have in mind right now. But at the end of the panel, we're going to have we're going to have uh, some time for for Q and A as well to make sure that now that you have them on stage and only today together, you actually tackle every questions you have about data. What are we? What do we need to track? And how do we use all the information that we get every single day from our user bases? Right. So, let's kick it off. First of all, um, well, we, the, the panelists were introduced, but just for you to to know the order. So this is Ben, this is Simon on from left to right, Charles and Peter. So I, I'm going to give you the chance to introduce yourself a little bit uh, more in a unique way. And especially, I want to know what makes your company different. So who are you and what makes your company different? Let's start with Ben. Uh, hello, I'm Ben. Uh, I lead our integrated partnerships and in business development here in the US for AppsFlyer. Uh, so that's working with top tier partners, uh, such as Facebook, Twitter, uh, many of the top ad networks you see in our performance reports. Uh, AppsFlyer is the worldwide leader in mobile attribution uh, by all independent metrics. <laughs> 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 Great job. <laughs> Simon. <laughs> sure, yeah. Um, I'm Simon. I'm the head of communications. I do things like I write case studies, I sit at conferences. Um, I've actually been with the Dust for three years, and before that, I actually did much what Ben is doing. Um, I worked with networks, integrating them. I worked with clients as, let's say, the, the last line technical support, that sort of thing. So, And then further on to products and stuff like this. Cool. What makes a just unique? Well, we happen to be international these days, but I think we have we came out of Germany, and I think that's kind of, let's say, that's still where our roots are. So I think what makes us unique uh, is that when we do build things, we build them properly. Uh, we don't half-ass things. <laughs> all right, all right. All right. Well, thanks, Simon, for being here. Charles. <laughs> Zick. A great panel and obviously a great room. I love this. <laughs> we, uh, there's a lot of familiar faces, so um, I think I know many folks here, many folks uh, know many of the folks on this panel. I'm Charles Manning. I'm the CEO of Kochava. Uh, you know, really excited about um, what attribution, what measurement is turning into. It's getting kind of a first class position. So it's a neat opportunity to talk about this in this context. and. Um, I think what you'll find through the next half an hour, and you'll probably find if you're on your own journey of what measurement means to you, uh, there's a lot of differences, a lot of unique elements from each vendor, um, and it just comes down to you know knowing the right questions to ask and knowing what you don't know that oftentimes bites you the, the worst. Mm -hmm. What makes us unique, what makes Kochava unique, um, we've been really proud of um, building a company that's sustainable and um, we, you know, we've never taken on um, outside capital. We've grown to serve some of the top brands in the world and, um, you know, fantastic business uh, from every metric. So I think that's one of the big things that makes us unique is just that uh, we've, we've taken the approach that we want to, you know, self-fund the business. And um, we're a little bit different in that we are located in a ski resort town in North Idaho. Yep. <laughs> and uh, we came from the Bay Area. We know the area very well. We've got a lot of good contacts with many of you, but we love being on the mountain. Are you the only, the, do you organize the only tech summit that happens in Idaho? Probably we, yes. We are the only, <laughs> You're the game only in tech town. conference in we Idaho. We are the only game in town. And, you know, <laughs> there's perks. Like the city will actually put banners along Main Street because they're so excited about the mayor comes. Yeah, it's pretty fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> very cool. Thanks, Charles. Peter. Hey guys, um, I'm the CEO of Tune, and uh, I have uh, two partners that are twin brothers and co-founders and some of the smartest gentlemen I've ever met, and are really at the heart of kind of how Tune came to be. 
we have a pretty hard focus on innovation and pivoting and moving toward whatever it is our customers are trying to do. That happened for us in 2011 with mobile. Uh, before that, we've been tracking performance campaigns for several years. And we realized, you, we gotta, we got to build something totally different for this thing. And uh, mobile has to be the first screen. We're about a 325-person uh, startup uh, now. And um, I would say what makes us different is uh, we have a very, very strong discipline around customer service. Um, our customer service team just completely blows me away all the time. We have 98% customer satisfaction ratings. Uh, we respond to everyone under an hour and get things done and get things solved. And that's really our goal in this whole thing. Like, you guys are busy. You're working hard trying to get these campaigns up and running. We're here to help when there are problems. So, um, yeah, that's me. Cool. Thank you so much, Peter. So to, to kick off the panel, I wanted to step back a little bit and give some, uh, give an industry outlook. And my first question is, I mean, we've been learning a lot about mobile. It's become competitive. It's become, uh, I mean, we're becoming smarter. We have better tools. But don't you think attribution should have been figured out already? And if that's the case, why do we still have so many attribution partners? Who wants to start with this? <laughs> Um, I mean, I think, I think the number is healthy. Uh, you know, as, uh, a good example is the number of founders they wanted a company. You know, if it was just one, uh, that's difficult. Things can go awry. If it's too many, of too many heads. Uh, we're here to be independent, uh, work across the industry, uh, be a moderator, uh, and uh, provide good technology. Okay. I mean, my, my general idea would be that a lot of the base attribution is kind of solved. Like the fundamental technologies from getting from point A to point B is, is kind of done. I mean, ultimately, we have to admit the technology that we use fundamentally is pretty much all the same here, mm -hmm. right? But then once you go past that and once you start branching out further, then you start seeing that there are different, let's say, philosophies that you can take and different paths that you can think about, certain decisions that you make along the road. So what's not solved is the further like post-install analysis. What's not solved is, you know, edge cases. We're still working on things like, you know, proper deep linking that really, really yep. works well, proper reattribution that really, really works well, this sort of stuff. That's, that's past basic attribution. Um, and that's why, you know, to a degree, I think there's not a monopoly and that would suck anyway. So there we are. Yeah. I think we're working with humans and so there's not really an absolute. Um, things are changing very rapidly. The way users are interacting with devices is changing very rapidly. How we think about attribution will always be changing and evolving. But I think the question really goes back to, you know, wh why are there still multiple CRM systems out there? And providers, it's because we're solving a workflow problem, guys. Mm -hmm. it, I mean, certainly, yeah, A plus B equals C. Yes, we can tell you the math. But how did you actually get to you know, spell out that equation in the first place? <laughs> like, how did you actually get the campaign up and running, close the loop with your partner, get them the creative, do all this stuff, right? That's why there's so many uh, people hopping in trying to provide better technologies to solve the workflow. And, and is this how you would explain the fact that we're still seeing newcomers in the, in the industry? I mean, we're talking, we have the most consolidated companies in that vertical right now in our panel, but we're, we're still seeing even the platforms, right? Facebook, Amazon, Google now launching their own tracking. I mean, what do you think is going to happen with these guys? And do they still have room when, when you've been doing that very well for a long time? One of the things that I think is really interesting about that, because you've got the platform guys who are all coming in with some kind of solution around attribution. There are certainly newcomers that are coming in. And what's, what's interesting, if you look at their messaging, their messaging is about, oh, we help you attribute email campaigns. Mm -hmm. well, been doing that for years. That's not <laughs> new, right? That's, that's not a fresh thing, but they're taking it from that approach. And I think that's going to end up happening while the, the audience, while the, the advertisers aren't totally clear what their strategy is in terms of this shift that's gone from desktop to mobile. And because the shift has happened and it's happened so quickly, there's been an opportunity for arguably very small companies to take a lion's share of this marketplace mm -hmm. and not have it be the big guys. The big guys thought they had plenty of time to, to innovate and to respond but they didn't and they didn't innovate and so that's been part of the issue but um you know why haven't we figured this out i i would do a plus one on on peter's comment that the the rules of an io are as dynamic as a negotiation <laughs> of a business dealing and if we are to be a measurement company that are going to that's going to manifest the 
kind of accountability of those rules, there needs to be dynamism in that platform. Dynamic look back windows, things like fractional attribution, influence support, things like that. And so we spend our time innovating on that. I know, uh, I know Tune has done a, a good job at that as well. Uh, I know you want us to wrestle a little bit, but I want to give props where Yeah, it's, we're starting it's with good. plus ones. Yeah. I, I'm not sure if I like that. Okay, <laughs> I will bring the clause well, back. As it, as it relates to sort of like, you know, Google Analytics and, and Facebook Analytics and, and all of the big publishers providing something, obviously there needs to be an onboarding process. There mm -hmm. needs to be a way for developers to get up and running with these publishers. They have to provide a solution that's absolutely necessary. Uh, when we launched our first tracking platform in 2009, everyone's like, well, why do I need that? I have Google Analytics. How are you different from Google Analytics? And we were like, well, we help you manage all of these relationships, all of these partners, all of these different advertising networks and, and that sort of thing. And, uh, and you know, for people that don't have to do the work every day and deal with the I.O., um, you know, that may not make a lot of sense to them, right? It's more than insights. It's, a, it's reconciliation, system of record, all of these things. I mean, I agree that it's, it's helping, you know, it's important for mobile first businesses and mobile growth to have some sort of mechanism to start campaigns immediately. Uh, but what we haven't seen is a non-independent, like a company uh, that's attribution, that's owned by a media company that's not independent. Uh, you haven't seen them exist in the long term. Everyone shut it down. Uh, it's a conflict of interest. Uh, the support's not there, the data quality's not there, the collection for other advertising campaigns. Uh, and I think, you know, that's, uh, there'll always be a need for independent attribution. Yeah. Still talking about the industry and the value of attribution, um, I see some familiar faces in the, in, the, in, the, in the room that come from big game developers with big marketing uh, budgets and, and big marketing teams, right? But it, my, my question is, we might have some indies here. I mean, do indies need to care about attribution or is this something that only applies to big uh, marketing budgets? Absolutely. And, and why? <laughs> I mean, everyone should be thinking about measurement in the same way that you should be thinking about, you know, whether you have electricity in your office. I mean, it, you need to understand what your audience is and, and what they're doing and how they're doing it. I would argue that um, if you're an indie, you have so much more insight than the publisher does, than the ad network does, when you're trying to negotiate what is going to work for you and what's not going to work for you when you try to grow your audience. Mm -hmm. And if you know who that audience is and you know where you have holes or you know what's monetizing, you know where people are taking the golden thread to in-app purchases, you know. And you start driving those insights. I would argue that indies need it even more than anyone else because they're not running against the problem of oversaturation. Mm -hmm. I would disagree with you. Would you? All right. Um, <laughs> now it's getting interesting. Well, at least I'm going to try to. Okay. Um, I, I, just, I just think that your priorities as a startup and when you're very small are just very, very different than when you have a marketing organization. Mm -hmm. um, if you are, for example, only going to start buying and testing some traffic with Facebook and you already have the Facebook SDK in your app, then I don't think you should go through the process of getting a third party in, right? You just need the basic, like, bare bones of, like, what exactly is happening and, and that it's performing or it's not performing. And, you know, you're going to build on top of that. As soon as you start introducing more partners and there's a workflow, like, difficulty that starts to happen, then you need something to help you. It's the same way you think about graduating into a CRM solution. Right? When you're a brand new business, you don't even need a CRM, man. You know your customers by name and everything about them, and you've signed the contract. Like, you've got it all figured out. But as it gets more complex and as you have more customers and more partners, uh, that starts to change. Uh, I'm going to agree with Peter on Facebook uh, and say that as a small dev, no, it's not the most important thing. Uh, retention and getting those initial metrics down, uh, finding out what's most, most important uh, with your game for general analytics uh, before third party tracking. But out of all the clients that I've talked to, I've not really met a single one that only has one marketing channel like Facebook. I mean, all the time they're doing other stuff. They're out on forums or they have websites or they're Even doing other indie. kind of... Yeah, absolutely. Um, a lot of other kinds of, let's say, outreach. And this stuff also needs to be tracked in roughly the same way that you would do Facebook. And that's why in that early stage, you still need a sort of holistic solution around that. Totally agree. Um, Google Analytics is free. Yeah. <laughs> One of the interesting things that anyone should consider, whether they're an indie or they're a big company, is what's the value of your audience data? Mm -hmm. And if you want to say 
you don't have time to understand your audience, and so you're going to go effectively give all your audience to another company for the benefit of having a singular line graph for engagement, you're crazy. Because that is the basis by which these companies make money. They use your data to target how they sell media elsewhere. And that's useful when you're on the buy side, but you're not getting compensated for that. And if the question is, should you have insight? The answer is yes. If the question is, should you forego the value of the business by giving all your data to a third party for which you get no value out of it? I don't think you should, but you should find another approach that allows you to do that. And I mean, another thing is we, we will be, or we have had a lot of chats about how you structure your attribution model and what sort of decisions you make about your attribution model. And these are We'll, not we'll get into that in a, in a minute. We'll get into that, but I'm just going to make a real quick point on that. <laughs> because what I tend to see is that um, the picture I have of what is a strong and good attribution model is often different from what my networks tell me is a strong and good attribution model, mm -hmm. right? And so if you're exclusively using tech from people who are also selling you the media, then of course you wind up in a situation where they're going to make those decisions yep. that I think are wrong. So you're asking for neutrality here. I think that's very important at any yep. stage of the chain. Cool. Let's get into the specifics now that you're starting to get into it. Um, so, so, I mean, again, we've learned a lot in the last three years, four years, uh, that, that mobile has become more mature and we've developed many, many new tools. And I'm still confused because once we learned to embrace last click attribution, then we started talking about view through attribution. So last click, view through, what's your take on that? Um. I mean, we've started to expand uh, with multi-touch attribution. Mm -hmm. So view through, uh, particularly driven by video ad networks. Uh, it's interesting, the big social networks are doing it, uh, it's supported. But I think the, the thing to look at is, is not just the last click, but multi-touch attribution. Mm -hmm. uh, what resources are assisting? Um, how does that user actually come into your application? Are they engaging in other places? Uh, and, and making that and showing that full path um, is, is probably the most important thing going forward. Okay, and, and how do you think, I mean, yes, on one hand, it's gonna increase install rates, you, you understand the, uh, the different avenues a little bit more, but I mean, what's the reception you're seeing from advertisers? How are we gonna, uh, how are advertisers gonna embrace multi-touch if they're doing that today? They're embracing it, they're embracing it at scale. Um, I, I would say view through attribution is as important as last click and the most important out of all of that is configurability by the advertiser. This is a attribution waterfall that whatever tool you choose, the tool should give you the capacity to define the rules by which the IO is governed as the system of record and it should be consistent uh, for whatever that is. So if you want to have view through attribution, that's great. If you want to have last click, that's great. If you want it to be fractional, great. But it's there and it's in black and white. I would say two interesting things. Does everyone remember when Facebook first came out with the mobile app ads product? Of course, <laughs> right? Does everyone breathe oxygen? Yeah. Um, so the interesting thing that they did is they exposed click attribution data to the mobile measurement partners. I'm sure everyone knows this because you all buy on Facebook. But the first screen you see on Facebook was view through attribution. And so it gives one a perception of lift, and it's not a false perception, it's an absolute and truthful perception. But the point is, is that they um, use the opportunity to show the value of views. And um, I think that's exactly what's now going through as a wave across other publishers. Why shouldn't other publishers with large volumes of inventory be able to play on an even playing ground that Facebook is certainly playing, at least from a perception perspective, from an optics perspective, and the tools need to be able to support that. And you know, this is a great differentiator. Does your vendor support view through attribution? And my general impression when Facebook first rolled that out was, well, at least my reaction to that was not so much that they were demonstrating the value of impressions. It was more that those numbers look a lot nicer. They tend to be bigger. <laughs> Both <laughs> in the same, yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, so I think um, last click is for compensation, right? That's, that's, um, that's all it is. Um, right. It's created to service an I.O., right? And um, so I, I love the idea of introducing more methods for compensating. Mm -hmm. um, so view through has a value. It's a different type of value. I think assists within a window can have another type of value. Yeah. Maybe someone clicked on something two weeks ago <laughs> and really thought hard about it <laughs> but decided not to and clicked on something else. Um, and, and so 
there's two sides of the coin. One, I would say that yes, advertisers are adopting it from an insights perspective, trying to holistically understand who is contributing the most value to what they're doing. Mm -hmm. But it is not, multi-touch is not part of the compensation model today. Do you think it will become eventually? Because I mean, all these tools that, all this flexibility that we're talking about gives a lot of power to the advertiser, but in the end, we need to be thankful to our publishers, right? Those that actually open up their inventory. So do that, you think question, that question for me is like, um, do you believe there is a heaven? Yes, I believe that there is a heaven. Uh, and it can happen, and these things, it, and this can, we can get to that point. I think what would happen if that occurred is suddenly we would know how display and performance relate to each other, mm -hmm. right? Um, how are we filling the top of the funnel and then educating and then closing with DR? Yep. And what's the relationship of that entire path? And we could compensate people in each of those buckets. It would be incredibly powerful because every publisher is different. Every ad unit is different. All right. We all agree. Uh, yeah, <laughs> totally agree. And let me just add one other point that's kind of a resonating theme that we use uh, internally, and that is that nothing is organic. And um, the, the reason we really have that as a core pitch is that fundamentally you have 80% of your traffic that's quote unquote organic and 20% which is paid. But the, the real reality is you've got email and you've got ASO and you've got uh, blog posts and you've got word of mouth and you've got all these other indexes uh, or indices and the challenge is it's really a function of what's tracked not what's organic mm -hmm. and so you you think about this question of um, you know attribution windows and, and this question of is view through or last click more important there are many many very very smart people who buy at scale who use last click to their advantage and um, that's good, they should, because that's the deal that they're engaging with their publishers on. But the publishers should equally um, recognize that and um, equally get credit for this valuable inventory that they're making available. And um, view through is a great way to do that. But I, I honestly find a little bit miss, no, I mean, absolutely very good points. And I think the main problem is that organic is kind of a misnomer. Mm. We should be calling it not attributed more not than attributed. anything else. Mm -hmm. um, that's really the point. Yeah, yeah and that's, that's, I think, it's just a fundamental problem of terminology. But um, generally speaking, I, I tend to find that it's better to talk about attribution models not so much in terms of, you know, who is getting the credit and, you know, who are we compensating for this because that's ultimately not what you need to, what sort of value you need to get out of the tool in the end. What you need to find out is what is working and what's not. And you need to find out, okay, what sort of people am I reaching here? What sort of people am I, am I reaching out to? Yeah, but these are both and. You don't pay a premium for someone unless you know that they're a whale. No, for sure. But my attribution model, I, I don't care so much when I build it mm -hmm. for, okay, let's, let's make sure that we're totally fair to every publisher down the line. What I care about is how do I get a really good segment that I can look at and that I can understand who I'm actually reaching here. And that's not saying anything about, let's say, multi-touch. That's not saying anything about view through. These are all very interesting techniques. But ultimately, uh, you know, giving conversation and giving credit to the right people, that's, not, that's a secondary goal. That's not the primary goal here. Mm -hmm. I, I like the point that, that Charles brought up when, when talking about that level of fine tuning. And they, advertisers need to know what, what they're Get what, what they're, where they're getting into, right? Let, let's talk about the attribution window itself. I mean, what are the, what do you, how does the decision-making uh, process look like or should look like when deciding, is it hours, is it seven days, is it 14 days, is it 28 days? What, what can you share? What best practices can you share? Uh, and what, what, are the, what, what, are, what are basically the, the outcomes of deciding a shorter uh, attribution window compared to a 20, eight-day attribution window? We have a thing called uh, MTTI. It's an acronym. acronym. I'm a, I'm a, I've got a bad habit of coming up with acronyms so I can remember them and kind of tokenize them across the team. But MTTI is mean time to install. And it's the time from the click until the first launch. So a little bit misnomer because it's not an install. It's the first launch. But that's the world we live in. We all know that that's what, what it is. So MTTI is the standard deviation from the click to the first launch. And All your it, clicks, even if they're duplicate clicks. Yep, yep. yep. Uh, and, and we, we measure that and track that as a kind of supplemental element uh, on top of everything else that is being done. And what you find is different app verticals have different MTTIs. Absolutely. Hookup apps are very quick. And <laughs> gaming apps are a little longer. I mean, they're you know, typically 32 hours-ish. And uh, you know, it depends on strategy or core. There's a lot of interesting nuances. And then um, you know, finance apps. They're like seven days mm -hmm. because you really want to get your finances in order, but 
later. Yep, I'll, I'll get that downloaded and installed and then I'll launch it later. And so what we always have, you know, from a methodology perspective, our recommendation is you take a look at the natural curve of MTTI from a, from a, a set of campaigns and that should be the basis of your look back because the, the, the camel's hump is the highest intent. And those, those, that audience is the, the one that you should be paying a premium for. Now, if you want to extend your look back window beyond that, great, but slice it out in multiple campaigns, with multiple trackers, multiple segment tiers, so that you can actually see what's working and what's not in that same A-B kind of fashion. Okay, so you, so you suggest testing and looking at these yeah, MTTI. Yeah, you should look at the natural MTTI. That should drive the look back. Yep. And if you're a publisher in the room, if you're an ad network in the room, and someone says, I want to do an I.O. and I want to have a, let's call it, f you know, 48 hour, uh, 36 hour, 72 hour look back window. Um, ding, 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 ding. We've got a premium here. <laughs> We've got an opportunity to take advantage of uh, the inventory that we clearly have demonstrated to them. Yep. I mean, I agree of looking at the curve. We've pulled the data umpteen times. Uh, we use a seven day last click attribution window uh, as a standard. Uh, from there, we see, you know, in the first few hours, you're getting 90, 95% of installs. We pull the data. You don't see the trailing into, into 28 days uh, that extends across. Uh, it's usually a question that comes from the network, not, not the advertiser about but the attribution. Do you guys have configurable look back windows? Uh, we do not. We keep it standard across all of our partners. <laughs> Again, not trying to be rough, but raise your hand if you have. <laughs> Pepe is going to hit me if I'm not being rough enough. So I, I mean, we we really look. We we talk to our advertisers about optimizing to a CPA, and the action in app, and we we spend our time there. Mm -hmm. I think it depends on um, what you're trying to do with look back look back windows. Um, if you're trying to actually determine, like from an insights perspective, what are the value of these two partners, mm -hmm. and I'm comparing them against each other. Um, you might want to use the same exact same data, yep. <laughs> right? Um, and you might even play with it and you might not use a window at all. You might just look at what are the proximities in general and how does this kind of look? Um, you know, at the beginning, uh, we started with like three day look back windows, you know, to, you know before Facebook mobile app install ads. Mm -hmm. and, and then sort of seven became the industry standard for a while and then Facebook came in and be like, oh, we're gonna take a month, right? <laughs> and um, and that, and that was for, for compensation, right? Mm -hmm. that, that they wanted to be compensated for that. And they are a very premium source and they know that they are. And right. you're going you're gonna to do it and you're going to take it and it's going to work for you and they're going to give you really high value users. And so they can, they can, take, they can take more in that negotiation that, that you were talking about there. Um, so when you think about what am I going to set for look back windows for the rest of my partners, it kind of depends on what kind of business person you are. Um, am I going to try to work people on my look back window or am I going to try to compare people the same and similar and, and try to make them, uh, you know, really equal in comparison and pay people sort of fairly? You know, that's, you know, it's kind of up to you. And, uh, but also, and I don't think you disagree with this, the feedback loop of postbacks back to the ad networks drives the waterfall and the positioning. Right. And so let there be no mistake. You are in charge of how much exposure you get. And look back window is just as much of an ingredient in that picture because it's creating that positive feedback loop that, that prioritizes. Ab absolutely. I mean, yes, we're giving the power to the advertiser, but that will have a strong impact on the potential uh, that they have in, in a waterfall, right? Yep. So cool. Um, I want to, so, so, I want to move to a more, um, I'm sure it's a topic that will add some discrepancy here. So basically, I'm, I'm worried b b because we're talking about an ideal environment where not everyone is playing the same roles. And I'm not going to mention uh, names, but not everyone is actually sharing the same amount of data. And not every, everyone is sharing the, uh, well, it's, it's using it in the same way, right? Who in our industry is in charge of the data integrity? And that uh, clicks that are being sent to you guys are actual clicks. If we're moving to a view through or a multi-touch uh, attribution, that views are also views and that we all have the same definition of views and that we're basically playing the same rules. Uh, ad networks, advertisers, third-party attributions, who should be in charge of that? Because right now, we're, we don't have that picture right now. Um, 
We should be solving those problems. I mean, this is this is a technology problem. Yep. Uh, discrepancies in data, data integrity, all these things can be solved. Um, there are, and you just sort of, it's a cat and mouse game a little bit because there's always something new that's coming in. Um, you know, if you you know move 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 a little bit more toward the topic of fraud, then it's a it's a game around thresholds and and uh, around ratios and around things like that, right? And you just got to get tighter and tighter and have better ways to slice and better ways to look at it. And and you know we're that's what we're here to do is build technology for for people to solve those problems. There's lots of companies and advertisers out there that have built those solutions themselves, and work and work very hard in their own data integrity. Mm -hmm. but, but there's some principles that you were asking about, Pepe. I mean, the principle was. Should there be a standards body? I mean, that's really what you're inferring. Well, or, or I, I mean, are you even doing a due diligence of the networks that you're integrated with oh, yeah. uh, when, when accepting them as, a, as a source? So here's, here's our perspective. This may be the same, this may be different, but our perspective is um, we believe that at the end of the day, this is the advertiser's data, whether it's organic installs or clicks or you know, paid installs, this is all the advertiser's data. So our responsibility is to make sure belt and suspenders, we're doing the right things with the data and we have contracts that support that. Mm -hmm. So the, every customer app is in its own shard in our system. There's no co kind of co-mingling at, um, at, the, at the schema level that, that ends up happening. There's no accidental SQL query that can pull data out in a bad way. Uh, we've got facilities in our technology that if a publisher has a particular requirement around how we handle the data that they send in, like for example Facebook, they've got a particular set of requirements. We've got a programmatic mechanism that will automatically purge data, uh, will re-anonymize the data after periods of time so that it's all automated and you mm -hmm. don't have to remember to do it. Um, that's the kind of a right things right approach because it, it says the advertiser with the advertiser dollars and who they choose as their measurement partner ultimately will be the market driver of what's the right approach. And you get a few slip ups in the market where the data is not handled right and then you know that gets learned, that, that gets processed. And, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I think row level data um, and aggregate level data ultimately is our customers and they need to have that. So, so when you think about, um, you know, we, we have a certified partner program trying to like get people to follow some best practices, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's very early and we're all sort of like coming along with these things. What, what does that mean, by the way? So we have 12, I think, criteria right now. And uh, across those, it's things like, you know, um, uh, have their post back templates set properly, um, are sending clicks properly, whether asynchronous or, or direct, uh, passing impression data, um, passing cost data, you know, all the things that a marketer needs to know, like are all these things already in place for me to start working with this partner, right? Um, and it's really, it's really all, it, it, and that's all it is, it's a checklist of, yep. of like, okay, I'm a marketer, I know that these things are already gonna be settled if I start working with this partner, and we're gonna start molding that a little bit more and get a little bit, you know, a little bit tighter around, you know, making sure everyone's trying to do the same things and work together. Mm -hmm. The thing is, um, on, our, on our platform, you also need to be able to work with partners that aren't, par you know, partners of ours, you know, and maybe sources that we've never heard of, and you need to be able to spin up a campaign and work with those people, um, so, you know, we're we're obviously not going to be vetting that partner or figuring out you know what's uh, what's what's their mo or if they're passing clicks properly. Um, so so there has to still be that agility and flexibility for you to be able to take any channel and, and pour it in, and then we can apply our own mechanisms to try to clean it up on the other side. Mm -hmm. Do you all have programs like this? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. And I mean, what you recognize, especially when we're doing. Sorry, I'll let you get no, to no, that. No, no. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. No, the thing is, I mean, um, I'm sure Ben recognizes this as well, because when you are, you know, looking at customers' data, and, you know, of course, as soon as a client has a problem with their app data, they, they come running to you and they start blaming you immediately. Mm -hmm. So if you're sitting as last line tech support, you, and especially if you're doing network integration at the same time, you are kind of eager that your networks are doing the right thing, right? So at that point, there's a real incentive for uh, tracking partners to make sure that the network partners are, are following certain standards, you know? And I've been on a lot of very hairy calls when someone's sending the wrong kind of, let's say, the wrong kind of impression or the wrong kind of view through, and it comes out looking all the weird in the end system, right? So, you know, what you wind up doing is these kind of programs that I think we're seeing a lot more of lately, um, not just, you know, from our side, but also from the, from the network sides, where you're looking at, okay, well, how well, how well does that come together, and are you actually following these kind of rules? And so at that point, you can go, I guess, one of two ways. You can either go and 
try and integrate as many partners as possible, or mm -hmm. you can say, okay, well, what are actually the sources we're going to work with primarily, and then provide, uh, as Peter's talking about, you know, what, how do we do that dynamically mm -hmm. once someone comes with a special request or something? But the misnomer, again, for the, the folks that haven't run their head into this wall several hundred times, the misnomer is like you, you find it and you fix it and we're all good and there's a golden seal of approval that's above it. And that's not entirely the case because when you have a, an ad network that is a loosely coupled agile ad, net, ad network that has any number of publishers who mm -hmm. are participating in that ad network and who may be mediating with other ad networks as mm -hmm. well, you end up having to have just as much kind of reputational overlay on the site ID by the ad network as you do on the ad network. Yep. And it's actually a false positive to believe we're good to go, this ad network is trustworthy because if you turn around and go to the ad network, good, healthy, red-blooded, well-meaning people, uh, they say, would you look at that? It's a bad publisher, bad publisher. my bad, let me blacklist it. Mm -hmm. So it's this constant cat and mouse like Peter was talking about. And that, I mean, that's, that's the, the issue. So I would argue it's not just a, you know, we don't, we don't um, kind of look at it as a certified list, but we do a stack rank that is by the kind of data the partner sends. Mm -hmm. And then um, there's kind of this, this kind of overtone of reputational value based on usage. Hurts you at first because you're a brand new pub, but it helps you over time because you've proved your, your worth. Yep. And uh, are you guys doing anything to detect fraud specifically? Install uh, uh, app install fraud, click uh, click fraud, and and how can we partner ad networks and everyone involved in the marketing ecosystem? How can we all help uh, advertisers detect fraudulent uh, sources of of traffic? Uh, absolutely, I I think um, you know on the on the fraud issue, it does come up. Uh, we're very committed to data transparency to our advertisers of showing them the raw data. Rules to click, rules to side ID, uh, having access to what we send back to the network, and also working with the network to show them that information too. So if there is publishers or issues, uh, a lot of networks are adding added security tokens and mm -hmm. fields uh, to verify the data integrity that they're uh, they're going. Only I have the feeling though that the weight right now falls on the networks only. What are you guys doing to prevent fraud? So we track the <laughs> crap out of all of this. <laughs> and what we have is a specific fraud product. You just get it at no additional charge if you're at a certain volume. And our, and our thesis behind this, at least now, is if you're at that volume, you're worrying about it. And if you're not, you're not worrying about it. And over time, we may monetize it differently. But that's our current model. And what it is is we've got between six and nine algorithms that we run through. and the publisher starts to care about fraud when the advertiser has more information than the publisher and says, I'm not paying this bill because of this data, and here are the specific records that mm -hmm. back it up. Yep. And then it's a whack-a-mole strategy, because you literally just do that one month, and then it's a separate set of side IDs the next month, and it's a separate set of side IDs. So yeah, you're talking about ratios and thresholds, right? You're looking at things that don't look right. Looks too good to be true, probably isn't true, you know? <laughs> and, and so this is, and it is kind of a game of whack-a-mole. I mean, there's, there's a couple of things, you know, that are just getting a little bit easier, and, you know, the platforms are providing, and, um, you know, we, I think people started to look at, you know, the fake purchases that were happening. Well, you can look at your iTunes receipt and you can see if that's a real purchase or not from an iTunes account. It doesn't solve for the person that has an iTunes account in Malaysia and is, you know, fake purchasing. But um, it does it does actually mean that there's a real user and Apple says it's right. Well, um, actually, you can do that with installs as well. Um, but the problem is a lot of people, and you guys should take note on this, that you need to collect your iTunes uh, receipts, okay? <laughs> Whether you're doing purchases or not, if you collect your iTunes receipts, then we know that this is a validated install. And if it's not, then we're not going to count it. We're not going to attribute it, right? Um, and so, you know, we've, we've, we've kind of been playing around with some ideas around, um, right now we just throw them away. What if we didn't throw them away? Yep. And uh, we showed which partners were bringing the ones that were absolutely false. Um, and so you can look at that in your own data and in your logs, but do you want a big beeping red dot next to all those? Uh, you know, we can, we can go down that road as well. But that's a pretty cut and dry method. And honestly, the platforms and, and the cool thing about mobile is they can really help us on these things. They can help us with, with fraud and, and with privacy, right? Yep. So. Cool. We're running out of, of time and I want to make sure that we have a full house and that we have time for questions. My very last question is, we've had uh, many talks about what 
what metrics are important, what piece, because at the end we're, we're trying to do all this to, to understand our user base. But my last question is, what metric do you think game developers are missing out? Not what is important, but what piece of data are we currently missing out? Well, I think the first thing that most people should, if, if it feels unfamiliar, the first thing you should go home and study is definitely good, strong, long cohort analysis, right? Mm -hmm. This is by far the stuff that I have to introduce too many gaming people to. Um, being able to understand, it, it takes a while to, to wrap your head around how you know, proper cohort analysis actually works down the line, but it gives you much faster feedback and it gives you much more robust metrics and you can see much quickly, much more quickly, how you're moving the needle. Yep, cohort reports. Right. Cohorts are great. Uh, we put a lot of emphasis on cohorts uh, for game developers and all our clients. Uh, I think rich in-app events, so not just an event name and an event value, but really understanding what that event was uh, as part of a game or an interaction uh, is an important thing to think about in the future. Can you give an example? Uh, a lot of it comes in, let's say, uh, travel or retail. If you're the destination, the purchase, the price on a game, it could be a level, it could be a completion, a stage. Um, you know, the overall session length of, of this user and, and thinking about that as a segment that you later want to uh, optimize towards. Yep. Charles? Um, I think I would echo, echo that point. So we, we, uh, we kind of, we built our analytics system early on on the notion that it was going to become a first class capability, not just kind of an add on to pass events. And when we went through that thinking, one of the things that we did was you can pass a full JSON object in the event value. JSON object means that you can notate any name value pair on any event. And so we recommend customers put in SKUs and you know current gold bar balance and discount amount and whatever else. And when that data gets introduced into the system, we then dynamically create objects that are by vector of the JSON. So you can just automatically visualize Show me the users who came from, you know, Appia. Saw Scott here today. Give him some props. Um, it came from Appia who um, did in-app purchases, but visualize it by SKU name, mm -hmm. or visualize it by discount amount. What that tells me is not just that there's buyers that are coming in from Appia. It tells me if I've got cheap buyers because they're always the discount guys, yep. or if I've got buyers of this specific slot pool or whatever. And Having a mechanism to just triangulate that data is really important, and it starts at the ins instrumentation level. Cool. Peter, uh, specific I think, metrics? Yeah, one of the biggest holes right now is around re-engagement, yep. bottom line. Um, too many, especially game developers, are not even tracking it at all. They're running re-engagement campaigns, and they're just like, it's got to be giving me lift. It's got to be good. Like, literally aren't even looking at it. It's mm -hmm. kind of ridiculous. Um, and then, so the next layer of that is actually doing incrementality testing mm -hmm. and having a control group that then you test your ads against the rest of the group, right? And so you have this untouched, you know, untapped group of users and you're comparing these two things. Uh, we saw, you know, the first real lift campaign started to come through television. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, and that makes sense. You can, you can run television ads in one geo, geo and not another geo. You can have a protected group. Um, but that should be the same thing going on with re-engagement. Um, and it's, it's super dangerous if you're not looking at that. Yep. Thank you. Do we have time for some questions? Perfect. Are there any questions in the room? James, yeah. over here. I'm going to flip it around and uh, ask a question for Chart Boost. So Chart Boost has been a <laughs> <laughs> boom. <laughs> here we are. <laughs> yeah, long time opposer of attribution on its network. And so, like, you know, what's your view on the need for attribution, and what kind of why the change of heart over after so long? Absolutely. Well, I, I wouldn't say we are an opposer. We've always been a big admirer of what these guys are doing. I mean, we've been following, learning, and getting more mature thanks to the great efforts that, that you guys are doing, right? Um, I would say the reason why we, we, are, we are a platform that needs to protect the advertiser and the publisher at the same time, right? And having full control transparency over the event that we're actually monetizing has always been extremely important, right? And part of it, I mean, understanding what methods are other networks using and really participating in an ecosystem that it's fair for everyone uh, is extremely important. So the reason why we've been observing how the, the how the how the these companies have been maturing as well their technologies and at the same time we've been 
getting ready for, for uh, embracing these technologies. We have a team dedicated to the integration with these guys as well, the same way they have a team dedicated to, uh, to us, to the ad networks, has been extremely important. It's, it took us some time because also the, the industry was maturing. So, I mean, we're, we're excited to have the team in place, the good relationship with them in place, and uh, we're excited to bring more business together. Time to try uh, SmartBid. Exactly. We, we've been talking about it a long time. I we know. just had to, you know, we had to, you know, get there. Absolutely. Well, here we are. Here we are. <laughs> um, congratulations on the Thank you, first James. Um, <laughs> another question for the group is um, some of your services claim to be more real time than others. I'm not going to say who, but um, can you guys elaborate on that a little bit? I mean, you need to build an architecture that actually can handle real time, right? And that means, you know, knowing your own stack intimately, knowing your own SDKs intimately, right? So, I mean, one of the key decisions we made was to not run anything on the cloud whatsoever. We build our entire stack from, from you know, top to bottom, which means that we can choose exactly which systems go in there. And we actually recently finished uh, migrating our entire, um, God, what are these called? These, these in-memory databases? Just to one that was just incrementally a little bit, li little bit faster, and that lets us do, lets us pull out the records immediately as soon as we see them, and lets us, you know, check okay, what's exactly the attribution that we made six months ago, right? And this is something that you need to have permeating your entire stack. Now, if you build on a different system, if you're not so familiar with it, then you might take a little bit longer pulling out the right records, creating the right callbacks, so on and so forth. I, I would do a latency study against the Just any day, uh, and speed. Uh, we have a great feature in our We're SDK uh, <laughs> called Get Attribution Data, and that's why a lot of our top tier partners love us because that attribution data is done in real time, and not just that, the advertiser is using that to customize the experience on the first load or, or the re-engagement about that attribution uh, on the client side, and you have to do, be real time to be able to do that capability. I think actually I have a case study on exactly that down in our booth, uh, if anyone's curious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, we really try to do, uh, you know, show a result within the next, you know, 60 seconds to three minutes. Um, we have done some heart beating. Uh, we haven't seen marketers really love heart beating. Um, you know, we, it's a part of the artisan product we just acquired. Um, we're honestly debating about what the, what the connection of that is to the Tune Marketing Console and if it really, you know, it's something that really marketers really want. Um, so, you know, I, I think you just, you need to have it quick enough or you can do something about it. I remember with Google Analytics, uh, was a day behind. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I remember when they were an hour behind. Uh, and, and, and so certainly you, you want to get closer to the curve, but you see even what Google has done is separated that out. You've got your heartbeated charts and you can see what's happening, uh, immediately. And then you have, you know, kind of the work you're doing in attribution as well. And I think, you know, when you're, when you're dealing with big data, you have to cut it those two different ways. If you want to provide those two views, honestly, when you get to a, a large enough data set. Yep. We, Dean has a question over there. Yeah, Dean Takahashi at VentureBeat. I just uh, wanted to get your perspective on uh, what happened behind the scenes when Facebook uh, uh, tried its uh, change to the policy on device level level uh, user data and, uh, and then backtracked on it. There was a lot of very <laughs> angry voices behind the scenes. Any, I, any I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have to give credit to Facebook because it, it, A, it was a bold move for them to do it in the first place, but I think it was even more bold that they retracted when they discovered it was the wrong decision to make. So I want to kind of paint this picture in the context of, uh, you know, very, very bold and very brave that they retracted it. I will say, and I'm sure I'm not alone, I had very poignant emails back and forth with several people at Facebook that <laughs> probably should have cost our relationship, but um, I wanted to make it clear that these are things that we will follow whatever policy you guys decide, but you are personally making the bed. And this isn't the way the space thinks about this world, and um, this is your opportunity to be the leader, and I have to give them credit for how they responded. I, I would echo that. Um, and the confidence that not just in themselves, but partners uh, was, was a big step. Uh, they're hearing the needs of advertisers there. Um, our integration, the technical side, did not change with Facebook, just the ability of what we could share. Uh, being able to calculate ROI, uh, they have the numbers to prove it. They had nothing to be, uh, to be shy about. Uh, and I think it goes to put aside, like now at this point, like all rumors aside, 
like the MMP program, Facebook, here to stay, uh, not going to change. Uh, I think it's now firm. Uh, going forward, I think you can trust Facebook and you can trust its partners. As the resident You're, Facebook partner expert, uh, <laughs> I would like to. <laughs> I've been waiting to say that this whole panel, actually. Um, I, I think um, this is the exact same issue that happened in August of 2013 between us and Facebook um, when IDFA came out. And Facebook said, oh, wait, we really don't want advertisers to have IDFA. And so we purged it from our system, and then advertisers went to Facebook and said, no, you can't do this. And they came out with the AMAM agreement. Um, and so it's been, you know, this has some history. It has a, has a couple of years. Um, and there's, there's, you know, really trying to work toward um, Facebook believes that, that measurement and attribution is a, is a core part of what they do and what they offer. And uh, you talk to the most senior executives at Facebook that will tell you that, that they will build excellent technology for measurement. Um, you know, and, and so, and, and you even saw in the email that they sent out to all the partners and, and all the marketers, they're like, well, we're going to give you this back, but you really should be using people-based marketing. Mm -hmm. um, and don't you forget it, right? Um, so what I would say is that I, I am, I am uh, optimistic about how advertisers were able to sway a decision. Um, that's very powerful, and it's the first time that's ever happened um, with Facebook, and and that's that's uh, you know that's an that's an exciting thing because um, Facebook is saying you know what marketers we want to do what's best for you and your mm -hmm. workflow, and we wanna we want to do what's what's the right thing for the industry, and that happened because marketers you know went in and they talked to their partner, which is Facebook, and and they ma they came to an agreement you know. And that's, that's all any of us can do, is, is build our relationships with each other, marketers and partners, uh, to agree on how these things are going to work. Cool. One very last question, if there's any. No more questions? Yes, over there. I believe you touched on this briefly around uh, attributing for television, but are you guys being asked, asked to track offline media? And if so, how are you addressing that with your partners? Yes, we're being asked. Uh, it's happening very frequently. We've got uh, TV attribution support. We've got iBeacon support. Not iBeacon like the context of, oh, I'm going to show this ad because the iBeacon detects it. Rather, iBeacon as another instrumentation point for attribution to say that someone showed up physically and had their hand on the front door handle to walk into the store. Uh, so it's another kind of data point in that life cycle, that customer journey. And we see, you know, we've got instrumentation to see Apple Watch, so you know who your Apple Watch customers are versus standard in the context of your measurement. So we think the you know, O2O stuff is critically, critically big growth area um, for our space and it, all of our space in general. Yeah, TV is getting really exciting. We've um, Germany's had quite a lot of game developers since quite a while. That's been doing you know TV for even for web apps way back in you know the late 90s, and so we have quite a lot of people there who, who have a bit of experience with this. And we've seen a, a fair couple of mobile campaigns that have been you know, very successful in finding very kind of uh, you know good ROI on on basic TV spots even in the off hours. Um, that I would say is uh, there's there's a couple of really good solutions already for for figuring out the, the the proper results of TV, but there are some improvements that I think still are kind of being worked on in the industry that I think should be, make it even more exciting. Uh, TV to mobile definitely uh, a, a big area, a lot of agencies, uh, and as you look at uh, uh, I forget what it's called, uh, direct audiences uh, that you can buy programmatic uh, like set top boxes and other measurement. Uh, but we're really just making it easy for the advertisers who are on TV today to measure their mobile impact, taking that out of their data science group and showing it um, very succinctly and showing that ROI within AppsFlyer. I think it's a complete mess. Um, I, I think there is uh, 
a lot of sort of talk about deterministic attribution with television to app, but the problem is is that people are influenced by television differently than the way they are on mobile devices, and you can get real probabilistic with it, and I honestly think folks like Adometry and Convertro and like those kinds of folks are doing a much better job of helping to solve that problem on, on sort of a week by week or queue over queue type of a basis. Um, but uh, deterministic is, is a hard thing to do when we're also in a shift. Yeah. yeah. It's not deterministic, and it's a hard thing to do when we're also in a shift where television is going to become a completely different beast altogether. We saw Netflix pass CBS uh, in revenue, uh, which is completely insane. Um, and, and by the way, that's a mobile app, guys. And uh, it has IDFAs, and <laughs> it can do really cool things with connecting to mobile app uh, uh, advertisers. Um, so you, you got to, you know, this whole thing is going to open up, and it's going to shift quite a bit. And we're going to get more data coming from television sets, and that's going to connect better to what we're doing. Um, and I feel the same way about beacons. I think beacons are a pass-through technology. They are to help us collect a bunch of data right now because we're pretty dumb about it. But we're going to skip past beacons, and there's going to be something a lot better than that on the other side. Um, so we're, there's a big transition going on here. So I, I think you know it's a it's still a squishy problem a little bit, and you gotta you gotta love data science, and you gotta love probabilistic models, and figuring. Out out how the lift uh, is interacting with your more deterministic you know performance based campaigns cool well thank you so much guys with that thought we're gonna leave it here thanks Peter Charles Simon and Ben